have an important update in the current lawsuits against the ATF and their pistol brace rule, including the nationwide injunction. The ATF has now pleaded their case to the Eighth Circuit, and it does not look good for the ATF. So let's talk about what just happened. Now, real quick, if you want to support this 2A content, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Also double check to make sure you're still subscribed because YouTube loves to unsubscribe people. And then also make sure you're liking this video. It would be really cool if we got 20,000 likes on this video. We, oftentimes, you know, we're getting about 10,000, but it would be cool if we can double that. So make sure you're liking this video. And also, I want to give a shout out to one of the main supporters and sponsors of this channel, which is First Form. First Form is an amazing company. They support what we're doing here on this channel. They support the freedom content we have, the pro 2A content that we have here. So if you guys want to support not just the channel, but support a pro freedom company, check out First Form, and I will leave a link to them down below in the detail section in the pinned comment. As I mentioned in the intro, in this video, we're going to be discussing a lawsuit which challenges the ATF's pistol brace rule. This new pistol brace rule makes it so that almost any pistol with a brace attached to it will now be considered an SBR and therefore subject to the interface restrictions. In response to that final rule by the ATF and that being published by the ATF, you know, Firearms Regulatory Accountability Coalition or FRAC, along with SB Tactical and then 25 states sued the ATF. You may recall that the ATF recently decided to roll the dice and appeal all the pistol brace cases that were in the Fifth Circuit. They appealed those up to the Fifth Circuit. We've talked about those cases and those appeals in the past. Those were the Mock v. Garland case by FBC and then also Brito v. Garland. And the Brito case is a significant case because that one deals with the nationwide injunction that is coming out of the Fifth Circuit area. But there are other major challenges in other jurisdictions, and this includes the Eighth Circuit. And the case we're going to be breaking down here is the Frack v. Garland case. And this case was recently heard in front of the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, a three-judge panel, and this happened last week. And listening to those arguments in the Eighth Circuit, I think the ATF is about to suffer another major loss when it comes to their braced pistol rule. Now, the plaintiffs in this case are Frack, 25 states, and then also SB Tactical. For those curious, the 25 states who joined as plaintiffs in this case to sue the ATF were West Virginia, North Dakota, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Utah, Virginia, and Wyoming. The frack case challenges that ATF rule along with all those other cases that came out of the Fifth Circuit, the Mock case, and then also the Brito case, and some other ones that are circulating around. Originally in Mock, the Fifth Circuit reviewed the case and found that Judge O'Connor should have granted an injunction to FBC at least on their APA claims. The Fifth Circuit's decision found that FBC did show a likelihood of success on the merits, which is one of the main factors to get a preliminary injunction. The Fifth Circuit then remanded the case back down to Judge O'Connor for him to re-decide the issue and re-look at the pistol brace injunction. And on re-review, Judge O'Connor, who was deciding the issue, he did find that the three remaining factors for the preliminary injunction were met, and therefore he granted a preliminary injunction. Now, that preliminary injunction protects FBC and their members, along with the company Maxim Defense and their customers. Mock was one of the first pistol brace wins. It was the most significant one originally. And then you had the Brito case, which kind of played off of what happened in that Mock case, played off of what happened in the Fifth Circuit, played off of the Judge O'Connor new preliminary injunction, and then issued its own injunction, which resulted in a nationwide injunction against the brace rule, which is still in place. Now, both the Mock case and the Brito case have now been appealed up to the Fifth Circuit. They've been consolidated in the Fifth Circuit, I believe, and they're going to be arguing from the Fifth Circuit to see whether or not those injunctions should stand. Now, while all that was happening in the Fifth Circuit, the frack case was making its way through the district court there in North Dakota. So this is a case originating out of a federal court in North Dakota. Now, on review, the lower court judge who reviewed the frack case denied the request for the original preliminary injunction finding that she believed Frack did not have a likelihood of success on the merits of this case. The judge believed that the ATF did not engage in the unlawful rulemaking process. Now, that denial of the preliminary injunction was then appealed up to a three-judge panel in the Eighth Circuit, and that led to the oral arguments that were held in the Eighth Circuit just last week. Now, the three judges who heard the arguments in this case were Judges Gruinger, who is a Bush appointee, Shepard, who is a Bush appointee, and then Grass, which is a Trump appointee. During the arguments, the judges were not favorable to the ATF and their attorney at all. And I think this decision will ultimately be three to zero against the ATF or at least two to one against the ATF. So I think this will ultimately result in a win. One of the interesting things about the arguments was the fact that Frack and their attorney and the 25 states attorneys actually received very little pushback from the judges here on the panel. 
and they actually received very little hypotheticals from the judges as well. Traditionally, during these types of arguments, the judges will ask very hard questions to essentially test the outer bands of whatever position you are having. So the pro 2A side, you know, you probably was expecting to get a lot of pushback from the judges, you know, testing their position, putting forward a bunch of hypotheticals, but there really wasn't a lot of that that came from the judges. And I think that actually kind of caught some of these attorneys off guard and there was some awkward, you know, points of silence because I think they were expecting much more pushback from the judges, which just didn't happen. It seemed like that they were very much against what the ATF is doing with this rule. The pro 2 side said that yes, the mock case, which they are using here also in this case, was decided by the Fifth Circuit on the APA's grounds on the logical outgrowth test. They didn't present the logical outgrowth test here in this frack case, but they did use something known as arbitrary and capricious arguments. They said that this violates the APA because it's arbitrary and capricious. And they said that the Fifth Circuit when reviewing mock found similar grounds and that supports their primary argument here in this case. They also argue that the Eighth Circuit simply needs to look at the NFA to see that these items fall outside of the plain text of what an SBR is. Therefore, they say that we should ultimately win this case using the plain text of the statute. But if the court finds that there is some sort of ambiguity in the statute, some sort of ambiguity in the language, well then, ultimately we should still win this case using the rule of lenity. That is because the rule here by the ATF has serious criminal implications when it comes to the NFA's application. And the rule of lenity would therefore direct the Eighth Circuit to find that this rule is invalid because of those criminal implications. They also point out that you can look at other issues in other circuits like the Sixth Circuits dealing with the bump stock issue. There in the Hardin case, they pointed to the fact that the ATF had consistently flip-flopped on the interpretations of what a bump stock was and whether or not it was a machine gun or not. And ultimately there in the Sixth Circuit, they struck down the ATF's application of bump stocks because of that flip-flopping. And here they said the ATF did the same thing with pistol braces. There were multiple times that the ATF looked at pistol braces, said that they were lawful, identified them as lawful items, said that they were not SBRs, and then now magically all of a sudden they've changed their position. Prior, they had said 17 braces were identified as lawful. Now, suddenly in the new rule, they're saying 60 out of 60 items that they reviewed are not lawful and therefore are SBRs. Now, like I said, FRAC in the 25 states received very little pushback from the judges, but in contrast, the ATF received a significant amount of pushback from these three judges. In fact, at one point during the arguments, one of the judges pointed out that, you know, if he were to look at his braced pistol that he has and try to analyze it using the ATF's six-factor test that they have in this rule, even he, the judge, would not be able to identify whether or not his gun is legal or not under this new rule. And that's important because when a judge himself is telling you that under your rule, he cannot identify whether or not his gun is legal or not, that's not a good sign for your arguments. The judges were also very concerned whether or not the ATF had identified any products in their rule that they deem lawful and therefore can be used under this rule. But the ATF had to essentially concede that no, there is nothing in their rule there are no items that they have identified as actually lawful under this rule. They have some hypothetical and theoretical braces with straps or spikes on the end of them that prevent you from shouldering them that maybe could be lawful, but they have not identified any items or any firearms that would be lawful. Now, one of the more interesting lines of questions was the fact that one of the judges asked the ATF at one point, what happens if a firearm is clearly a pistol? Let's say he has a firearm that is clearly a pistol and then he adds a brace to it. What then, you know, happens under this rule? Because what if this brace on it, you know, under the ATF's rule says that, hey, this is an SBR, it's regulated under the NFA. What happens if he decides to take that brace off? Is it then no longer an NFA item? Is it no longer an SBR? The ATF's attorney had to say, well, if you take that brace off, it still remains as an NFA item. It is still an SBR according to the ATF. You know, the fact that you put it on for one second makes it an SBR forever, you know, and to all existence, and it changes that characteristic forever. And I think some of these judges really had concerns about that ATF interpretation. Now, to close out the arguments in the Eighth Circuit, the judges also asked the pro to a side what they should do if they do grant a preliminary injunction. What type of relief do they want? And ultimately, the pro to a side said that they want the preliminary injunction and they want it to be a nationwide block of this rule. And really, one of the main reasons also is because the plaintiffs that are involved in this case. You have FRAC, that is an organization that has a lot of members. You have 25 states and all of their residents that are represented in this case. And then you also have SB Tactical and all their customers, which make up a large sum of the entire industry when it comes to braces. And therefore, they're asking for a nationwide injunction. 
So as I mentioned, the tone of the judges seemed to be in favor of the Pro-2A side, and I think the Eighth Circuit case will ultimately lead to another favorable decision striking down this brace rule. So that's where the pistol brace issue currently stands. Huge arguments took place in the Eighth Circuit, and it seems like the ATF is going to take another loss. Of course, if anything develops, if we get any more information, I will let you guys know. Also, if you like this video and you like to support the channel, one of the best ways to do that is to like, comment, and subscribe. All those things help to fuel the algorithm, and it signals to YouTube that you guys see value in these videos and in this type of two-way news. But as always, thank you all for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And don't forget, this station was built by Arm Scholars, and the station will be maintained by Arm Scholars.